Okay, I think we're running. You remember everything? That, there's a video camera there being taped. I work for the judge. Yep. Yeah. Don't work for either side, but the two sides may see the video, the report, things like that, right? Okay. Okay. Um, how was it last night? Did you sleep okay? Yeah. Reasonable dinner. Tacos. Taco. Yeah. Is there a regular um, a regular menu rotation so you can kind of? No, they don't give us a menu, and it's yeah. usually different. So it's not like Friday is pork chop day or something. Right. Like that. They don't have like, Italian night or whatever. Okay. Any thoughts about the things we talked about yesterday? Nope. Things that I may have missed or misunderstood or that you wanted to add about yesterday? No. Nope. Okay. Today, I suspect that we will work long enough so that we don't take a lunch break. Okay. Um, it's not going to go six or seven hours the way Dr. Greer did, but I suspect we'll go for three hours or so. Um, We'll take a break to change the media in the, in the camera, and then maybe go another hour or so, and that'll probably be it. Okay. All right. Okay. Looks like you had a shower this morning. Yep. Shower. Um, I'd like to go over some things that I've kind of marked in the notes of our previous talk up at, at uh, SimHill and a couple of other things, is kind of jump around a little bit. Um, let's see what I have here. You said to, you may not have said it directly to him, uh, but Dr. Metzner uh, has noted some things about what you described as trying to physically and mentally differentiate yourself from your normal self. Does that ring a bell at all? Um, I, I think when he asked about the photos, I said I was trying to differentiate myself. From my normal okay, and the dyed hair, that, that makes sense yeah. based on what I have here. Um, You apparently used the phrase that you were making sure that you were distinct, quote, from my crazy self. Can you tell me what the context of that is in terms of the photos and the dyed hair? Um, I'm not sure the context. Okay. Um, you were, you were talking about protecting your normal self because, quote, the other me did everything. He said this protection worked because I can blame it on the possessed James. All right, so the contact lenses they had were called uh, possession lenses. That was their brand name or their model name, wasn't it? Uh, 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 just uh, their uh, character, characterization. A characterization of them. Was that like in the in the way you would order them? They are possession lenses, yeah, they or call is that a phrase that you would give to no, them? No, they call them possession lenses. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, how about the phrase "I can blame it"? And I think we're referring to the killings. I can blame it on the possessed James. Right, so I can pay. Uh, transfer the blame to this kind of crazy self of me. Okay. And I think you're referring to the way that you were thinking before the event, around the time you were creating a notebook and things like that. Is that your understanding too? Yeah, it's a, it's a, Um, you haven't used the word very much with me, but you did with, with Dr. Messner, I think, 
Um, no, you did with Gardi in some texts. The word evil. Or does right, I said it wasn't inherently evil. Mm -hmm. um, where does your concept of evil fit in all this? Um, well, killing people is considered evil. Considered evil by? Uh, everyone. Everyone to include you or, or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Think about it a little for me. You said everyone considers killing to be evil. Right, sometimes it's a necessity, like in war. Right. But I think we're referring to killings such as you were thinking about with Gargi or, or such as you did. Are you part of the everyone that considers it evil? No, I don't think so. If everyone considers them evil, is there a reason that they should consider your act evil even though you say that you don't consider it evil? That's not a very clear question. How much, how much um, uh, weight should we give to your simply saying, I don't think it, it was evil? That's up to the person to decide. I'm sorry? That's up to the person to decide. Up to the person who's, who's saying? Who's saying you? that. Okay. Meaning it's up to you to decide whether it's evil or not? No, it's up to whoever's trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, one of the things that you said to Gargi in the, in the interaction I think it was back in March, late March of 2012, was that what you feel like doing is evil, that is the act. What, what I feel like doing is evil, so can't do that. And you were referring to, in your words, kill people, of course. At that time, at least what you said to Gargi was what you were contemplating doing was evil. It's considered evil by society. Okay. Well, you said to her that it's not just considered evil, you said it is evil. And I'm wondering, there are a lot of, a lot of reasons that you might have said that to her. Uh, is that the way you felt about it when you said it, as far as you can remember? I guess so. And it was a long time ago, but and it was in a particular context, I understand that. Yeah. You've referred several times to life in one way or another being meaningless or not having meaning saying that in one way or another in your writings and things like that. Is that fair to say? Right, I couldn't find a meaning to life. Okay. Do you still feel that way, by the way? Oh, uh, yeah. When you were texting to Gargi, you said, if there's a meaning to life, and you take that away from other people, you have prevented their purpose. So you're making it conditional if there's a meaning to life. But it sounds like, at least in that interchange, you're considering that there might be a meaning and taking it away from other people prevents their purpose. Does that make sense? or? Yeah, I'm misunderstanding. No, it makes sense. Okay. You say a little further down that if you take away their purpose, quote, it still makes my life more meaningful. Sorry, it's kind of back to that value system. Okay. 
and healthcare that, that helps. Because you haven't really clarified what the meaning might be, but one of the things, correct me if I'm wrong, is the value system, the, the human capital value. Right. You talk about that. And you, Kind of looking at me like a deer in headlights, and I don't know whether you're following or whether I'm being clear or not. Can you help me out with that? Um, well, if they have a purpose, you kind of absorb that purpose when you kill them. Okay. And do you think, sitting here today, do you think they have a purpose? I don't know what the purpose is. Do you think they have a purpose? Um, I'd say no. As you were thinking about it two or three years ago, so far as you recall, at that time, did you think they had a purpose? Even if you didn't know what it was? Uh, could be. I don't remember. Well. Fair enough. By the way, may I take your pulse once more? Okay. I'm sorry, I keep kicking you know, that's the second time I've done that. Coming back to the, the word evil, you referred at least once with uh, Dr. Messner that you thought killing people at the time was evil because it was against the law. Do you remember that or is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, is there any other context in which killing people might be evil except it's just against the law? Uh, if the other person doesn't want to die. And what would that have to do with it being evil? Uh, if you're going against somebody's wishes. I can think of situations where one might go against somebody else's wishes and it wouldn't be evil. Right. I don't, on want, a case I by don't case. want to work, but my boss forces me to go to work. Okay. Go ahead. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, talk to me about morally evil, killing people in the context that we're talking about today. Talk to me about morally evil. Uh, what's there to talk about? What comes to mind? Uh, something that's against the law. Uh, and if you do it, then it's morally evil. I'm sorry? And if you do it, it's morally evil. That's kind of circular, though. What we talked yesterday about your view of morals in, in one way, moral relativism. Right. That is, what's moral is what you think is moral, and what's immoral is what you think is immoral. Am I, am I paraphrasing that? Reasonably? Pretty much so. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going back to killing people in the way you did. Can you talk to me about it in a context of, e of evil, or does that simply not apply? No, because it wasn't malicious.
it's not malicious, then what was it? Some other adjectives besides malicious? I think you use the word necessary at some point. Yeah, to complete the mission, yeah. yeah. It wasn't malicious, was it benign? No, it was still harmful. Harmful, okay. Would you say it was indifferent to the morality of it? Or I didn't really consider the morality irrelevant to the morality of it. Or... Okay. I don't want to interrupt you, but you, you, you did answer. You said you didn't consider the morality of it. All right. And do you have a feel for a reason that you didn't consider the morality of it? It just wouldn't, it didn't matter morally. Didn't, didn't matter morally, okay. You spent lots of time preparing, lots of time thinking about it. Sure. In one way or another. Does it make sense that other people might think about it in terms of morals? Or evil yeah. or, or mattering or something? Okay. Would they be accurate in thinking about it in terms of morals or evil or it mattering? The lives mattering? Um, it's all subjective in their opinion. But from your viewpoint, it was simply not something that came to mind. Right. You did think about whether or not children would be killed, though. Did you think about that beforehand or, or just afterwards? Um, beforehand, because I chose a, a time, and you know, I guess it was PG-13, so. So that was some level of consideration of what was right to do and what wasn't right to do in your mind, it sounds like. Uh, I think it's wrong to kill children. So you were considering at least one thing having to do with right or wrong. And that was had to do with children and you wanted to leave them out of the equation. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I may have asked you this some time ago. Um, if you kill children, do you still get a, a, a point for that death? Oh uh, yeah, because their lives are valuable too. Do you get any more for killing a child because of perhaps the increased potential or something like that? Not by the system, I mean. But... Okay. <clears throat> but you get credit, if you will, for killing them, but they're the only group of people that you've mentioned so far anyway, for which, in the balance of whether I get the point and whether they matter, they matter enough for you not to want to kill them. Is that fair to say? Right, yeah. Is there any other group of folks that, um, in some way or other, matters, maybe with regard to right and wrong or, or your moral thought, matters enough that you would not or do not want to kill them to get their point. No, no. Any particular cutoff for when the child becomes grown up enough to kill? I could say 12. 12, okay. Were you thinking like that, do you think, two and a half years ago, or is that something that you kind of rest or, or, or 
thinking about right now? Well, it was kind of after the fact. <clears throat> You mentioned to Hillary at some point uh, that you were bad news bears. She should stay away from. Her. Yeah, um, I wanted to protect her. Um, I know it's sort of a an off the cuff phrase, but what does it mean? that you thought of yourself as bad news bears, or were you just kind of saying that as a matter of conversation? Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. I think it was a movie or something once. Sure, sure. I guess what I'm getting at is, did you think of yourself as bad? I thought other people would view me as bad. Did you think of yourself as bad? No. As I say, it sounds kind of like an off-the-cuff remark and not a deep philosophical thought. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Here's something I asked about a little earlier, actually. Um, The pictures that the people sent you, almost all women, sent you that you some of which you put up on your on your cell in, in the square. Right. Um, I think you mentioned to me that they sent those pictures because they were supportive of you. Yeah. Any other reason that they sent you those pictures that you could think of, or that you thought of, a couple of years ago? Well, if they liked me or not. How did they know about? Media coverage, I think. Through media coverage. Do you think any of them were responding to your uh, internet dating the adult friend finder? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That was also one of the reasons. Tell me how many, all of them, or a few of them, or maybe one or two, knew about you from there. At least a couple. Some said they were on match and that they had like. Uh, a match with me or whatever. So some specifically mentioned that? Yeah. Okay. Do you know how long, and you may not know this, <coughs> how long your profile stayed up on those sites or on Dolphin friend, friend Finder? I know they took them down. I don't know when. Maybe it was up a week. Week since this year, it was, it was up for a while before and too. The one that was up beforehand, it would have been an email sent to you, sent to your mailbox at the service, rather than something posted to the jail. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I don't remember getting any emails. Okay. How many of the, those services did you uh, try or did you join? Uh, Match.com and Adult Friend Finder. There was an indication that you uh, canceled your subscription but it may not have been to Adult Friend Finder. You canceled at least one of your internet subscriptions that had to do with women. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think it was triplexmatch.com. Okay. So that was that was another kind of match deal that was a little more... Another sexual. dating site, yeah. Was it a little more sexually oriented, the triple X in it? or? Um, yeah, I think so. Did you get any responses from that? TripleXMax.com. Yeah, but I think they were fake from the employers trying to get you to buy more services. How did they do that? 
will they just post a fake profile and then contact you? Say, hey, let's hang out for a group. Did the, the stuff that they would send get pretty explicit, or would it be, hey, let's go have coffee? Um, no, I wanted it too raunchy. I'm sorry? It wasn't too raunchy. Okay. <clears throat> you said to Dr. Messner at some point, that one of the things you couldn't talk to Dr. Fenton about was that you were buying weapons and that you thought you were crazy because killing people is crazy. Do you remember that general? Yeah. And that I wanted to be locked up. Right, part of me didn't want to do a transition. I think we talked about that a fair amount, about what part of you wanted to be stopped or controlled or locked up, what part of you didn't. Right, yeah. I asked yesterday a little bit, and, and I'll just kind of recap it. We generally describe those as two parts of the same person, kind of wrestling inside, and not as two separate people. Right, it was still one, one me. And you were aware of both of those parts of you? Yeah. Or no? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> talked a fair amount about your thoughts that one of the reasons that you had to carry out the mission was so that you wouldn't commit suicide. To, to save your life, sort of. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or at least to help with the depression. Right. But suicide figured in there, the potential for suicide and preventing you from being that depressed at MRI. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, Tell me about the concept of trading other people's lives for yours. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. In order for you, according to what you said, in order for you to have a likelihood of not committing suicide, sure. then you were willing to kill multiple other people to get that chance. That's what I mean by trading other people's lives for yours. Yeah, it's part of what I did. I'm sorry? It's part of what I did. Okay. Tell me about the rightness or wrongness or morality or logic of, of, of that. I guess I'm thinking about moral logic, whatever that means to you. Uh, just that it was necessary to do what was in my best interest. If it's in my best interest to kill people in order to have a chance at feeling better, not a guarantee, but a chance, does that seem okay or not? Or does that fit in the moral scheme of things? Uh, well, it's against the law. Okay, we talked about being against the law, you're pretty aware of that. But I'm really talking a little deeper than that. Well, I guess it would be selfish if you did that. Selfish is one word. Anything... Actually, it seems real selfish. Too. Yeah, real selfish. It almost sounds, and I'm not saying that it's the same, but like 
I want a thrill, and killing you will give me a thrill, so it's okay to kill you in my mind. I know you didn't kill for the thrill of it. Yeah, At least I don't think you killed for the thrill of it. No. But it sounds like there's something I want, and it's okay for me to kill you because I want it. I'd say it's more, it's something I need. Okay. As opposed to want. Prior to the killings, you've not given me any indication that prior to the killings, you ever considered killing other people just because you needed something they had, except for, except for this, the planning for this event. Um, you've not struck me as that selfish except in this instance. Okay. Does that make sense or that's kind of a vague statement, I guess? Uh, no, it seems to make sense. And another point, I mean, it, uh, one of the notes I have at the margin of that is, is question mark, trade other people's lives for his. At the time, did that sound like a reasonable trade? Uh, yes. Does it still sound like a reasonable trade? Yeah. We take that a step further, if I may. You've indicated to various folks that you thought there was a maybe 50-50 chance that killing the other people, excuse me, would make you feel better, would alleviate your depression, maybe a 50-50 chance. Did you feel like it was, or, or is it okay to kill other people for a 50-50 chance at feeling better? <clears throat> There's no other option. What other options might there have been? Uh, if therapy worked. I'm sorry? If therapy worked. Okay. Was the therapy working? Uh, no. You've said several times that you did feel less anxious. It wasn't working in regards to the depression. How many times had you gone to the psychiatrist about it? Five to ten times, I think. Okay. I think you gave it a fair chance. Um, I there was kind of a misunderstanding that they didn't know I was depressed, but I thought they knew I was depressed. Did you tell them that you were depressed? No, what happened was I got the search link and I looked it up online and saw that it was for depression. So I thought they were treating me for depression. To be fair, you weren't telling them everything. Yeah, you... I held back. Yeah. Okay. So You hoped that the treatment with Finn would give you an alternative. Is that fair to say? I think that's kind of what you just said. Yeah. yeah. Why would it have been helpful to have an alternative? That uh, here's the, here's what I'm thinking as I as I ask that. <clears throat> 
if there's not much that's morally wrong with killing other people for this purpose, to make yourself feel better, um, or to bring yourself more value, why would you bother to hope that Fenton might be able to change that? Um, because if she could cure me, then I wouldn't need to be isolated or in jail, or prison. Okay. You've jumped from the neither wish to kill people to isolation in jail. That's taking my thoughts to isolation in jail, the wish to be isolated in jail, being a reason for killing. Oh, uh, yeah, to be isolated. I'm sorry? Uh, to be isolated, not necessarily in jail. But as we've said, I think many times, the very predictable end result, consequence, of this train of plans is being of the mission incarcerated. is being incarcerated, either being dead or being incarcerated. Right. And as, as you said, the chances of simply escaping were pretty, very minuscule. Right. Um, okay. Let me shift gears again. Um, I want to talk with you about the phrase dysphoric mania again. Dysphoric mania. I don't think you ever brought that up with Dr. Fenton. I don't see it in the notes. I don't recall seeing it in the notes. Um, but you described that as one of the things that you're pretty sure was present right. during that period for a long time. Tell me again what dysphoric mania was to you, what it felt like. Well, that goes back to the feelings of hyperspeed and invincibility. It's like the manic symptoms. Okay. But all the while, I was still depressed, so it was dysphoric instead of euphoric. Okay. About how long was it that you had those periods of what you're referring to as the dysphoric mania? I understand they came and went. Sometimes, I think you said two, three, four times a week. Do I remember that right? It sounds right. Okay. Over what period of time did you have those episodes? I think until I started the antidepressants or anxiolytic. And then it was only depression and not maybe as you Let me see if I understand you right. It started with the prescribing of the antidepressants and the anxiety? No, it ended. Ended with it. Yeah. Okay, so that's about where it ended. Okay. And roughly when did it start? Uh, no, actually it started at the head end of the anxiety. I think, I think the medication uh, caused me to go manic sometimes. The, the medication caused you to go mad, or in a dysphoric way. Yeah. Okay. And I recall you're saying that it stayed roughly the same for a period. When did it end, if it did? Well, I don't think I'm manic anymore, okay. but I'm not sure what time it <clears> ended. <throat> okay. Did it continue until the shooting, at least? Any questions about the stuff we just talked about? Any expansion of those? No. I'm reminded that the 
pretty much everything you talked about with Dr. Fenton, you recall talking about about the mission has to do with helping you to not be depressed or suicidal and bringing the value of, in other people to you, which also would help you to feel better. Right. There's little or no mention of the hatred of mankind business that we've talked about a bit, unless I ask for it, unless I specifically ask about it. Everything in the record for several months up to the shootings refers to a benefit to you in terms of not being depressed anymore, not being suicidal anymore, and or <clears throat> having the value of the people that you kill. Right, I think I was manic when I wrote uh, the hatred part. You have talked to several people about the hatred part at other times in your life as well, but you're talking about when you wrote the hatred part in your notebook. Um, no, I didn't generally share it. I think I said it to Ben once. Okay. okay. I think you're right. I'd like to go now through some questions I had about the time we spent together at Simhill. Um, <clears throat> and again, it'll, it'll skip around quite a lot. talked a lot about your relationship with your family, about your family supporting you while you're here. At one point you said that one reason that you'd like to stay alive is because it would hurt your family if, if you were dead. Yeah. Um, Are there times when you get kind of emotional thinking about your family? Mother, dad, sister? No, not really. Not even when you're by yourself? In the cell or at night? No. I think you mentioned that occasionally you get a tear in your eye. I've not seen you come close to tears. It's not always unusual, but we've talked about some very emotional subjects sometimes. Have you I said think closer to the incident, I was more emotional. About about the incident or about the thing? About, no, not about the incident. Just closer to the incident, I was more emotional towards my family, that they cared about me and stuff. When you say close to the incident, do you mean close after the incident? Yes, after. Okay. okay. What do you make of it not being, the, the closeness not being so emotional now? Oh, uh, well, it's kind of accepted the way things are. <clears throat> I think I asked you uh, uh, yesterday how much you looked forward 
to hearing from your folks who are on your deck. Let me ask you again, if I have. How much do you look forward to it, think about it, versus, oh, a letter appeared and my lawyers gave it to me? Uh, no, I'm happy when they send me letters. Do you think about they're sending you letters before you get the letter that is looked forward to? Yeah. <clears throat> if they miss a week or if the letter is a bit late, does that trouble you? No, it's kind of an erratic schedule because they don't, well, my lawyers don't bring them every week. So they might bring two or three on a certain day. We know that Chris doesn't write to you. Would you like for her to write to you? Would you prefer it or not? Um, well, my mom usually writes what my sister is up to anyway. Would you like for Chris to write to you? Would you prefer it or not? Uh, it doesn't matter if she writes it. That sort of sounds like she doesn't matter. How she thinks about me doesn't matter. Whether I'm in her mind doesn't matter. Whether um, I'm in her thoughts doesn't matter. Is that close or not close? Not close. Can you talk to me about how that's not close? Because you use the phrase, it doesn't matter whether she writes or not. Right, because they know she loves you anyway. Okay. And you've said that before. You, you've told me that before. Right. Okay. If I know someone loves me, whether they write to me or not, I still might like to hear from them, prefer to hear from them, versus not hear from them. Right, if I had a choice, I would want to hear from them. Okay. With the choice you'd want. Okay. <clears throat> Did your family um, take many pictures or videos when you guys went places like the trip to Lake Tahoe, things like that? Um, I'm not sure. I wasn't the one taking the pictures. Well, that raises an interesting thing because I, I was, I hadn't asked your folks for for photos like that. That's what I was referring to, but you raised another point. Um, did you ever take pictures of stuff on, on your phone? I know you took some because we've seen the context, contents of your phone. How much did you want to remember events with friends or family? Um, I didn't take that many. Maybe 10. <coughs> Do you think about those events now? Do you enjoy remembering them, or is it not particularly important to you? Think about it. Do you think about those times? Are they important to you or not important to you at this point? We're talking about family vacations. Times, good times with family, good times with friends. Uh, yeah, the pictures aren't important. It's what they represent was important. Do you think about what they represent very much? The good times with family, good times with friends. It's a fond memory. How much do those memories come up in your mind? Uh, maybe once a day. And when they come up, how do they feel? How do you feel? Uh, reminiscent. Can you expand on that a little? What do you mean? How do you feel when those fond memories come up? Uh, that those were happy times in my life. How else does it make you feel that those were happy times? 
Uh, it also makes me remorseful that I won't have uh, new fond memories of it. So you anticipate not having, I think you said, any new fond memories? Oh, yes. Sounds a little sad. Sounds very sad, actually. Yeah. Might you tear up a little when you're by yourself? Think about that, those fond memories? Uh, I used to, but not anymore. You mentioned the medication, but you were prescribed the anxiety medication. I saw a note where actually my assistant typed that you'd taken Xanax, and I don't recall your mentioning Xanax. I don't recall you. Okay, I think it was a typo on her part or mishear, mishearing something. I took uh, Zantac. Zantac, that's where she made this. Zantac. Or uh, in industry. Gotcha. That, that explains it. Thank you. We talked a little bit at one point about the reason or reasons that you stopped shooting and left the theater. Um, can you reiterate for me a bit, why did you stop? I felt that I shot enough people. And the other was the, the weapon jamming. Those are and, the, and those are the two things that I recall as well. The weapon jamming, and you couldn't uh, jam it easily. Right. Um, and you felt that you'd shot enough people. Although you still had a handgun and many rounds. Right. With you. Did you feel that you were in danger? No. Okay. So that wasn't part of the reason that you left at, the, at that point? No. Do you remember how you left the process that you went through when you said, in one way or another, I'm going to leave now? What happened? Uh, I just walked out the emergency exit. Door. You walked. Yeah. At some point, you were up the aisle toward the entrance right. under one of the lines. That's where I walked from. Okay, so it's a fairly long walk. Not really. Down to the half of the auditorium, give or take, or, or, or not. It didn't seem very long. Okay. Um, you walked toward the exit. Walked fast, walked slowly. Give me some adjectives or adverbs about how you walked. Uh, just a normal walking pace. As you walked, do you remember looking around? Uh, yeah, I looked back at the theater seats. And no one was sitting in them. They were all crouched down behind the seat. Okay. As you walked out and looked around, did you think that someone might be dangerous to you, rushing you or shooting at you or anything like that? Or um, were you just no. moseying out of the theater? I was just walking out of the thing. I remember you mentioned looking back and there was a guy in the front row smiling. Right, yeah. Any thoughts, other thoughts about his smiling? I don't know why he was smiling. Do you think he might have been grimacing rather than smiling? No, I'm pretty positive he didn't smile. So you don't think he was grimacing because he was hurt? No, he wasn't like. Uh, holding his leg or arm or anything. 
that would suggest that. Was he sitting in the seat or crouching or hunkering down behind it? He was sitting in front of his seat. So he was quite exposed. Because he, he was in the front row too. Do you recall whether he was sitting on his seat or sitting? He wasn't on the, on the seat. No, nobody oh. was on their seats at the end. Of it. Do I understand that he was on the floor in front of his seat? Right. Can you describe how he was sitting? Just with his legs to the side, uh, kind of leaning against the seat. What makes you think that he wasn't wounded? Uh, he wasn't. It didn't look like he was in pain at all. But he was pretty exposed. Right. Yeah. Um. Did you think about shooting him? No. What do you make of that? It, that it probably would have been really personal. Just you, a person who's smiling at you. So from the time you started walking, did you fire at all on your way out? No. no. Did you have your handgun out? or? I had the... Uh, Assault rifle wall that I was trying to put a magazine in. Was the handgun in your hand as you walked, or do you remember? No, uh, it was in my belt. In your belt. Um, as you walked out, thinking down the aisle, there's kind of a curtain that creates the exit aisle, am I right? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. As you go behind the screen, I never went behind the screen. There's a there's a space behind the screen where they thought somebody might be hiding there, so they cut it down. Okay, but the door, the exit door, is in the same plane as the screen, or behind the plane of the screen? Uh, behind a bit. Okay, and that's kind of what I meant. Was there some sort of... There wasn't like an obstacle in the way. Okay. Did you see anybody in front of you as you walked in? No. But I think you said you observed some people going out that way. Yeah, like Earlier. four people carrying one guy. Any idea what happened to that guy or to those four people? I uh, no, there were so many... I'm sorry? There were so many injured, I don't know. Quite well. Did you notice the blood outside the door as you left? Yeah, there were blood smears. Did you think anything about that blood or what it might have been due to? Well, the guy they carried out got shot. Does that raise any thoughts about what happened to him? What was going to happen? I thought he would be taken for medical assistance. Then when you got outside, as I understand it, at some point fairly soon, you saw two officers facing away from you. They looked at you and then they were, then they walked away from you, is that right? Yeah. And why do you think they walked away from you? Because uh, I think they thought I was uh, a spot or a policeman. Okay, that's my understanding too. And they're walking away. You have the handgun. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, you thought about shooting them but did not shoot them. Or, or is that not quite right? No, that's pretty accurate. Okay. Tell me about the reasoning at that point in which you didn't shoot it? Well, I considered the mission over, so by that point. Did you consider that it might be dangerous to shoot at them? Yeah, I also didn't want to get shot back. So 
but one of the factors was you considered the mission over. Right. How did it feel to consider the mission over? Do you remember the feeling, the visceral feeling, anything like that? Uh, relief. Okay. Tell me more about that. Um, well, I was finally done uh, doing the shooting. You used a phrase in another context that you had accomplished your mission. Was that a feeling at that time, or did that come later? Uh, I'm not sure. At what point did you take the handgun out and put it on top of the car? Once I saw the backs of the two police officers. Okay. Just to clarify my own thoughts and not, and not overthink something. You took the handgun out, put it on top of the car. Was there a point at which you thought about shooting them and decided not to? Or did you never, as far as you recall, think about shooting them? Well, I figured if they shot at me, then I would have easy access to the handgun to shoot them back. But otherwise, I didn't think about shooting. You talked about having some trouble studying, trouble focusing on your studies in January, February of 2012. And when we talked, you attributed that to being depressed. Do you recall that conversation or that thought? No, not really. Okay. What I was asking myself was, might your difficulty focusing on the studies in January, February, have had to do with your mono, mono It could have. I was pretty sick. How long were you pretty sick with that? Uh, <coughs> two, three months. Two, three months. And over that two or three months, that would be January, February, March, or? Uh, December, January. December, January, February. When you say pretty sick, can you describe again for me how you were sick? Uh, fatigued, and coughing, and having a sore throat. Were there very many days when you couldn't go or didn't go to class or lab? No, I still I went to every class and every lab. Every class and every lab. Talk just a little bit more about the thoughts that you were under surveillance when you were planning things and ordering weapons and, and going to Byers Canyon, etc. Um, you used the phrase, or one reason that you thought you were under surveillance was that you were going to commit a crime. Right, I think if you're doing something illegal you probably become more aware of police around you. At the time, not as you think about it now, but perhaps a bit clearer ahead, at the time, do you think you were just hypersensitized because you were planning a crime, to use your word? Or do you think you were... I think there was some paranoia. Tell me what you mean by paranoia. Um, imagining the people were after me when they weren't. Imagining means to me sort of a thought about something. 
somewhere out on maybe the same spectrum, there's the deep, true belief that they're after you or watching you. Can you pinpoint a little bit for me on that spectrum where you were with that back in? On a little bit more moderate, the deep seated. I'm sorry? Then deep seated. A little more moderate than deep seated. Did you do anything to combat the possibility of surveillance? Uh, I closed all the blinds in my apartment. Anything else? No. Did you keep the blinds closed all the time or close them some of the time? All the time. And by closed, the blinds are down and the slats are? So nobody can see them. Um, when, for example, did you do the, the dark tint of my new car windows? Um, well, I bought the stuff before I, I bought the window tinting before I installed it, like a, a week or so before. And was the idea, did the idea have to do with preparation for the mission, or did you just like tinted windows? It was in case anybody walked out in back of the theater so they wouldn't see. So it was specifically about the mission itself, not about what you might have been carrying in the back seat in the weeks before the mission. Right, I didn't install the window tip until like just before the mission. Okay, okay. Any other things that you did that were to combat the idea of surveillance? No. I think you mentioned that in your web searches, your online purchases and things, you used your real name, your real credit card, you didn't use a proxy server. Is that right? Right. You know what I mean by proxy server? Um, just another server that kind of would mask the server I was using. Yeah. A way to mask your identity on the web. Um, did you ever see around your building, for example, cars that you thought might be there to observe you, or FBI, or law enforcement? Or? I saw law enforcement, but there's a bar like right across the street. Did there ever come a time when you were pretty sure that the car was there for you and not for the bar? Uh, once or twice, but it was an unmarked vehicle. So it's like... When you say an unmarked vehicle? Yeah, because your typical cruiser kind of is like, uh, all black. Kind of Crown Victoria with spotlights or something? Something, something that really looked like an unmarked vehicle, or, or something that you, looking back on it, may have imagined was an unmarked vehicle? Uh, something that I imagined was. Looking back, are you pretty sure it really was an unmarked vehicle or not? I'm not sure either. Okay. Where were those cars parked on those one or two occasions that you described? Uh, across the street. Across the street. Um, Relative to your apartment, would that be a good place to observe or not, or more logical to think of it as with the bar? Or I think it would be just uh, trying to get drunk drivers from the bar. Okay. I'd probably ask this as well, but you, you use Buyers Canyon as a place to practice. Right. And that's two and a half hour drive. Well, two hours. Two, two hours. Hour drive. Okay. Um, any particular reason that you wanted something that far away? Um, no, I went to it mainly because it was unsupervised. Okay. And I remember your mentioning that. When you were firing the weapons, I've asked you before, and I'd like to ask you again, actually. What was the feeling when you 
first fired the weapons there, later on when you fired the weapons, how did it feel to shoot those weapons? It felt routine. Routine? Yeah. Even the first time? Yeah. There wasn't any special emotions attached to it. You fired lots and lots and lots of rounds. Right. I mean, really thousands of rounds. Yeah. Um, unless you were there for many, many hours, you probably fired, at least some of the time, very rapidly. Is that fair to say? Um, yes. As you're, as you're firing the rounds, what position were you in? What physical position were you in? Standing up. Always standing? Um, well, I tried crouching a couple times just to mix it up. Did you ever fire them while you were moving, while you were running or walking? Yeah, I would move side to side and shoot at the front. Do you recall making any noises when you did that? No, I didn't make any noise. Yelling or screaming or saying, take that or no, not gotcha really. or anything like that? No, it's just a paper target. So. You raise another interesting point. You were shooting at paper targets. They were body mass targets, I think, right? Life-size uh, silhouettes or not? Uh, they were close, close to life-size silhouettes. When you did that, do you recall ever imagining uh, that they weren't paper targets? No, they, I strictly knew they were paper targets. I need to take a quick break. Okay. I'm going to ask the gentleman to come in while I go to the restroom. If that's all right with you. Let's see if I can use the Okay. Appreciate that break. Let me take your pulse once more, man. Any questions about anything we talked about before that? Nope. Oh, break. Continuing then to kind of go through some of the things that I thought about after our last meeting. Um, We've talked a bit about reasons, motivations for the shooting, and really for the whole process that happened before the shooting, <clears throat> the shooting itself. We talked about the clear expectation that one way or another you would be controlled when the shooting occurred, after, after the shooting occurred. Uh, and the likelihood that you'd be in a situation such as you are in. Yeah. <clears throat> We've talked a little less about the idea of being remembered. I remember we looked at some photographs, we talked about your thoughts of posting something with the New York Times. Talk with me about, again, being remembered, if you can. Well, that's just what the photographs were for, is to be remembered. Can you talk with me again about how you believe you'll be remembered? There's not so much a for or how reason. It's just 
this is the photograph of me, and that as well will be the one that. Going back to July of uh, 2012, I remember you and I looking at the photograph, or the various photographs together, and you're talking about what they might mean and, and how people might interpret them as they remember you or simply interpret the photographs. What were some of the things that you remember came up in our discussion? Uh, that it was devil-like. Okay. One of them was kind of devil-like. Okay. What else? That's the only one I remember. I remember you're talking about uh, being a dangerous person. Right, it kind of portrayed uh, a dangerous quality to it. Tell me about being remembered as dangerous, particularly as you might have thought about it a couple of years ago. Just that this isn't someone you want to mess with. What does that bring to mind? I'm not sure. The first time you bought a gun. Actually, the, the, your first purchase was a taser. A taser, no. Yeah. You talked about defensive thoughts rather than offensive thoughts. Yeah. You're in a position and a situation now that have in another way something to do with not wanting to be messed with. And we talked about fantasies that you might be killed. Right, yeah. Um, But I'm really anticipate. I'm really referring to back in June, July of 2012. What kind of a person doesn't get messed with? A uh, tough guy. How does that fit with you? Mm -hmm. Literally, kind of frightening pictures. How does that fit with you, Jimmy Holmes? Uh, it's unusual because I'm not normally a tough, a tough guy. Go ahead. I don't know what else to say. That usually doesn't get you off the hook with Frank, so we, yes. just, we just remain silent until you say something. I may not do that to you here, but but uh, that you're not a tough guy. Not normally a tough guy. Not normally a tough guy. In what context or situation are you a tough guy? In the context of the shooting. Were you a tough guy during the shooting? Yeah. Talk to me about the tough guy during the shooting. Well, well I'm all decked out in body armor and weapons, so it gives off a tough uh, as essence. Do you remember it feeling tough? Feeling like a tough guy? No, not really. Do you remember before the shootings it feeling like a tough guy or anticipating being a tough guy? A little. Tell me what you remember about that. Uh, just some taking the pictures. Uh, they look different from what I normally look like. 
and different in the sense of uh, having the hair dye in a contact position when using. The regalia is real clear to me as real in the room, tough guy stuff. The contacts, particularly with the name of the contacts, possession contact lenses, and to some extent the hair, says to me something different from solid, I can reach out and touch the tough. Does that make any sense? Um, a little bit. What are the possession lenses or what they represent or what they felt like, better yet? What they felt like. What does that have to do with tough guy or not tough guy or with something else? I'm not sure. What comes to mind? Just that it would be frightening to whoever saw it. Did anybody ever see you with the contacts on? Uh, no, only through the photos. Only through the photo. And it would be frightening to whoever saw it. Yeah. Frightening in what way? A frightening or you Possession brings to mind, to me anyway, a cult, mysterious. The armor, on the other hand, brings to mind physical, tough, can't get through it. So, yeah, the, the lenses are more psychological and toughness. Okay. Where does the hair fit in? Or was it just a fluke kind of, I'd like to dye my hair, I want to change things? Yeah, I didn't really have a reason to dye my hair. Looking back on it, when Ben dyed his hair, he says, I just wanted to change. He's dyed his hair many times, he said. Was that close to your concept of dyeing your hair? Or was that quite different, so far as you can recall, from the reason that you dyed your hair? Well, it certainly was a change, because I never dyed my hair before. <clears throat> Do you remember having anything in mind about dyeing it, or about the color itself? Um, well, red suggests bravery. Is the James Holmes of 2010-2011, early 2012, a brave guy? Uh, yeah. How are you? How were you at that time a brave guy? <clears throat> to a new state in a new area. I'm sorry. I, I was hear. moving to a new state. And I was doing new things. And that takes some courage. Rather than just doing uh, what you always do. Was the James or the Jimmy Holmes of 2010, 2011, early 2012 a frightened guy, a scared guy? No. When Hillary's screen was cut, that was 
May, something like that. It was well after you had started to prepare these things, or no? When Hillary screamed, what are you referring to? Somebody tried to break into her place. Oh, okay, yeah. Like they cut it with a knife. Okay. I think I remember the time, the, the chronology of things. That was before I bought the first handgun. Okay. You had brought, you, you had bought the taser and the knife, but not the handgun. Is that your memory? I'm not sure when I bought the taser and uh, taser and knife. But they were before the handgun, right? Yes. Okay. Um, did her being broken into, or, or attempted breaking, apparently attempted breaking, did that scare you with regard to your safety? It motivated me to be more prepared and set up a defense. When that occurred, once again, I'm trying to get the timeline straight in my mind. <clears throat> Was that around the time you guys, the, the short period in which you, you guys dated and hung out together? Or was that before you started hanging out together for a short time? Uh, I don't remember the context in when I heard it. Okay. But what you just said was you did feel like creating a, some sort of perimeter some sort of doing something to make things more safe for yourself. Is yeah. That fair to say. Okay. Do you remember about the time that doing the defensive things began to morph into doing the offensive things, or were they completely separate? Um. Well, once I bought the shotgun, it was an offensive thing. <clears throat> so, you said once you bought the shotgun, how, how about before you bought the shotgun, when you... It was still defensive. ...decided to go get it? Oh, well, when I decided to go get it, it was an offensive thing. It was going to be an offensive thing. We talked a bit at some hip about some of the people in your family that have passed away. Not very many folks have. I think both your grandfathers and our and grandmothers. Okay. Um, can you talk a little more about the death? I, I, for some reason, I have circled the. the your mom's father who passed away when you were little, I think, right? Yeah. Do you remember very much about interacting with him? Uh, no. I was a little... Doing up close to the eye. We don't generally interfere with seeing things far away. Let me give you an example, because you're a guy that has worn glasses, and I'm a guy that wears glasses, yeah. okay? When your glasses are a little dirty, um, somebody else may say, oh, your glasses are dirty, but you can still see pretty darn well through I the glasses. I could still see with the gas mask on. Okay. But because it was dark, darker inside than outside, it was hard to focus. Okay. You had the gas mask on before you went back in. Right. You could see to open the door, things like that, to get back. Yeah, so it was pretty partial obstruction. Okay. Fair enough.
Let me come back for just a minute to the way you might have wanted to be remembered. I'm not talking so much about now, but the way you believe you wanted to be remembered at the time of the shootings or just before the shootings. Can you talk a little more about that? I just wanted to be a member uh, visually by my, my picture. Which picture? Any of the ones that were on my phone. One of the ones, or a couple of the ones, were headshots of you with a sort of, uh, not sure how to interpret it, devilish or impish or, or whimsical look, looking at the, the incendiary with the fuse, holding the gun, things like that. Um, another one was of, I'm trying to remember, wasn't there one of you in most of the regalia? Or yeah, there was one where I was wearing the coat in my dress. Okay. So which is the one that conveys, if it is just one, which is the one that conveys the way that James wanted to be remembered to James before the shoot? I think the most powerful image was the one where I was holding the gun in front of my feet. Holding the gun in front of your face, yeah. Yeah. And that would convey to somebody five years from now, what? Just that they would remember the picture and that was James Holmes. That was James Holmes. And what was James Holmes? In the they don't need to remember what that or I'm sorry? They don't need to remember anything extra. Just have a memory of the face. I'm not sure I understand. They don't need to remember anything extra. Uh, yeah, all they need to remember is, is that's what James Holmes looked like. So having people remember what you looked like, not forget your face in a sense. But there's a certain attitude to that picture. Yeah. Want them to remember that attitude as well. They don't have to. But I mean, that was the one you picked of the various pictures that had slightly different attitudes. All of them had some of the equipment in them. I guess if they want to remember that, it's worth it, they can. You're not saying that they would remember the picture of you with the poster of the woman behind you. I don't think that was as powerful an image as the other one in terms of not powerful. You're not saying they would remember the picture of you on the hike. Right. Because? Because it's not as strong an image. It's not something memorable. Not something? It's not something as memorable as, as one ven- think of. As venerable. Oh, memorable. Memorable, okay. That's a strong guy in the picture. Are you a pretty strong guy? Uh, average. Person. At the time that you took the pictures, did you believe you were a pretty strong guy? Yeah, I think so. Let me spin out a couple of thoughts. One is, I'm a strong guy, and that's why I'm taking this picture of me as a strong guy. That I want people to remember me as a strong guy. Another line of thought would be, I'm not such a strong guy, but I can make them think I was a strong guy and make them remember me as a strong guy if I, I take this was, picture. I'm sorry? I don't think that was... I don't think that was it. No. Why would they remember your face anyway? Well, because it's unusual to have 
uh, dyed hair like that and caught my phone decently. I'm more Did likely you, to remember something unusual than something mundane. The elephant in the room, of course, is the shooting as the thing that they will remember and attach the picture to the shooting. Right, so at least they have some memory of who I am. Because I can't particularly think of a picture of a guy holding a gun five years ago unless I attach it to some other event that to make it makes, make sense. makes me remember. Okay. okay. So my mind goes to, it was a strong guy that killed these people. The picture of the guy that killed these people indicates he was a strong guy. It's not even accurate. Is it accurate? Sure. And those are the words that, that seem to lead up to that. The words you've used seem to lead up to, here's the picture, the re re reason I remember him is that he's the fellow that killed the people in the theater. And the picture shows a strong guy. So James Holmes, the guy who killed the people in the theater, must have been a strong guy. It, is that a train of thought that... I'm not sure if strong is the word tied to it or not. Okay. And again, there's a danger that I'm putting too much of, of my association into it. But the place that my mind goes with it is that people are not remembering James Holmes as a weak guy or a mediocre guy. Oh, right, yeah, I would say that's true. Is there anything wrong with them remembering you as a mediocre guy or a weak guy? Just that it wouldn't be memorable. Okay. Go through just a couple more pages here. I ask you what it felt like to be arrested. The officer's coming up and, and you surrendering. Everything kind of went as expected. Okay. You had a tough time getting to the feelings associated with being arrested. You talked about the process, but not the feelings associated with being arrested. I don't think there were any strong feelings. Do you remember any particular strong feeling during that process? Any particular feeling, visceral or mental or emotional? Uh, just when I saw, when I got out of the elevator in the police station, there it said child homicide like section. Okay. And we talked a bit about, about that and your were you surprised that a child had been killed? Yeah. Okay. I didn't think there were going to be any children there. Did you feel sure there were going to be any children there? Like 80% of children. You described child within the context of the folks that, in this context, you didn't mind killing as somebody under 12. All right. It's a PG-13 movie. Seems to me that there are an awful lot of kids under 12 at PG-13 movies. Not at midnight. Not at midnight. Okay. Good point. And we talked about, even had there been no children, 
the fact that the people who were killed were likely some of them to be parents of children. Right, I never considered that until you brought it up. Wasn't a consideration that was not relevant or not considered or an indifferent factor. Okay, yeah. The two guys who questioned you, uh, Detective Gumbiner and Detective Apple, you remember those names or, or not? I remember Detective Apple. Okay. Was Gumbiner the FBI he was, specialist? He was part of it, and uh, um, I'm not remembering exactly what his title was, but he was with the FBI. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think of the way that they? talked with you or interrogated you? Oh, it was pretty standard. It was kind of conversational. Were you surprised at any of it or upset by any of it? I was uh, upset that they took a clandestine recording of the session without telling me. Hmm. The clan meaning it was audio recorded or audio, audio recorded. Audio recorded. Okay. Was that the recording of when you were talking about well there was one point where they talked with you and then you invoked your Miranda rights. Right, like right away. There was another one where you were talking about the devices in your apartment. That's the one I was talking about. Okay. And it, it was you were con you were upset that they had recorded it. Oh, um, well, I'm upset now because I didn't know at the time that they were recording it. Can you tell me more about being upset about that? Uh, just that I was helping them out, and they were not looking in my best interest. They were doing it for their own personal reasons. When they were interrogating you about the event, about the shooting, would you have expected that to be recorded? Yes, they had a and video recorded. Okay. What do you remember about their style of interviewing you or interrogating? They would just ask me questions and I would answer them. Were they pretty smart about it, or dumb about it, or...? No, pretty standard. That's cool. Do you think that their interview of you, their interrogation of you, was effective? Got what they were after? Yeah, yeah. Was it because they were good at it, or because you were free with the information, or both? Because they cooperated. You talked a little bit about you're going to court. Once again, I, and you weren't sure, I think, the first time I asked this. Do you remember about when the first time you went to court was? About how many days after you were arrested or how many? I don't remember. It was too long ago. Okay. At the time, you said you didn't remember much about that event, about being in court. Right. We talked about Dr. Woodcock seeing him. We've talked a couple of times about the money that, that was mailed with the notebook. The several hundred dollars and twenty dollar bills that were burned at the edges. In one time at one time you told me that you burned the money because you wouldn't have any use for it. Right, once I got locked up or dead, I couldn't use any money to kill. But you burned it in a particular way. So uh, she would still be able to tell it was money. 
and the communication to her was what with the right one? Uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, because I wouldn't have insurance and it costed like $80 an hour for each session. So what were you telling her with the money? Uh, that money was a problem. You didn't just send her the money, you sent it to her with the four corners of every bill burned off and the bills carefully plastered onto sheets as I recall. No, actually I just put it all on the back of the notebook. I think they may have might have done that in the sheets later. Okay, so you didn't take them down to sheets or glue them to sheets? No, they were just loose, loosely leafed. Okay, thank you for clarifying that because I wasn't sure about that. Um, what did the burning the edges mean, if anything, as part of the communication to Dr. Finn? Uh, just what I said before. Well, you could have just sent the money. Right, but sure. then she would have misinterpreted, like, why is he paying me money? you think she would have considered it a payment to receive that? I don't know what she would have I mean, pay, Payment doesn't come to my mind, at least. The money means something. Psychiatrists always think money means lots of things. Right. But payment is not one of the ones I would have come up with. You burned the edges and sent her several hundred dollars. Right, I was trying to tell her that because I lost my job, I subsequently lost the insurance from it. So my illness was like at fault. It sounds like you were mad at her. Almost saying, here you greedy shrink, here's the damn money. Uh, could be. I wasn't too angry though. Explore that could be a little bit for me. Uh, well, it is kind of a mean thing to do to send her a notebook of all the information she didn't collect and burn money, which is the reason why. Uh, Was there anything in it of, look what you did, Fenton? A little bit, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it's kind of similar to like that emoticon I sent for which he messed up my uh, prescription. When you sent the emoticon, one of your impressions or one of your thoughts was that it might have frightened her. Yeah, if she misinterpreted it as me hitting her instead of it being a, a blow to the face that she couldn't remember my name or anything. I'd suggest to you the possibility that at least part of the emoticon was an angry thing. And it wasn't her mis it wouldn't be her misinterpreting because part of the emoticon really had at least some irritation to it because she inconvenienced you and she misunderstood you and didn't this is just read talking, didn't value you enough to get the right name on the damn prescription. Yeah, so it was a little bit hostile. Hostile is a real civilized word. Angry me, man is a little bit me. Let me come back to the to the burned money. Any anger, meanness? Look what you did, or boy, you'll think about this for a long time, Fenton. In the money? Yeah, I think it's valueless. 
Can you talk to me about that emotion at the time? Just that I was showing her what I was doing wrong, or showing showing her what she did wrong. Tell me what you might have been showing her that she was doing wrong. Uh, well, because of my illness, I uh, uh, I could no longer go to the. Uh, assessments because it was expensive. Is that a truly good reason that you didn't go to the sessions, or is that not much of the reason that you didn't continue the sessions? Well, the main reason was I was uh, set on the mission. I kind of had an excuse to get out. An excuse to get out of, of the sessions? Yeah. Okay. Because you actually knew at the time that there were a lot of ways that you could have continued the sessions, and they they offered to had offered they, they had, un, unlike the school they had offered ways to continue the sessions. Is that accurate? Yeah, for the summer. I can't think of much else to ask you. What have I left out? I have no idea. I think you've been pretty comprehensive. Want to expand on anything that we've talked about? Nope. Um, if there's anything that you want to communicate to me through your lawyers at any point, you're welcome to tell them, hey, tell this to read, and they will do that. All right. I suspect we won't talk again, at least not for some time. It's possible if I come back for a hearing or something that we would talk again. But I think I have everything that I need to do my task. Once again, I'll wish you what I wish everybody I see, and I hope whatever happens is fair. Okay. Okay. All right.